Okay, we're live, Ray. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining in this hangout. You sent over a pull request on this Eagle Board import widget in Chili Pepper earlier, and I, I merged the changes and published them, and they're so awesome. I wanted to show everybody all the awesome work you did. And so I was wondering if you could, you know, take us through it, give us a little summary, and then we'll we'll share the screen and, and have you walk folks through it. Of course. So yeah, I mean, up until this point, a little while ago, Chili Peppers Eagle uh, import functionality has been, hey, you pull in your Eagle BRD file, and you can render and mill and create uh, toolpaths for the top layer. But in today's day and age, competing with our, you know, fabricating partners in America, around the globe, China. Two layer boards are the bare minimum nowadays. And then, you know, we've got four, eight, 16 layer motherboards for, you know, high MPV stuff that I try not to think about or my head gets a little crazy. I, I so, agree. With you. I feel like, uh, you know, we are stuck in sort of a single board world in this DIY PCB community. And, uh, you know, you, uh, you've got this way more figured out now um, to get us to the next yeah. step. Absolutely. So I think we'll jump right into it. I'm going to share my screen here once I okay. figure out yeah. where that button is. Yeah, there it's in the upper left corner there. Um, that yep. green. I've got mine going too. But we'll, okay. let, you, we'll let you do sure. it. Right, so we've got, you know, Chili Pepper with a fully revamped home page, thanks to you. <laughs> and then now, again, thanks to you, we can just load up Tiny G. So if we load up the Tiny G workspace here, here we are. And then we've got Eagle BRD import right here. Yep. So just for scale, I'm actually going to load in the Arduino Due, which is, you know, a fairly complex board, and I can just drag that right in. Boy, you are going for it with a very yeah, good board. Absolutely. Good oh, my Lord, look at that thing. Yes. Do not count the, num the number of vias or you will have nightmares. It is that simple. Gorgeous. Yeah. I've never dragged that one in. I've only done the Arduino Micro, which is a four-layer board. Yeah, you've seen some of the boards I designed, so the Micro is a little too small for my taste. I like to you know, go big because that's what I need to do, or I can't do anything at all. Yeah. So the Duet well, is a bit better of a representation of that. Look how long that rendering takes there. Yeah, absolutely. Whoop. OK, this has never happened before. It's probably because we're screen sharing, so Chrome is processing yeah. that as well. There we go. Yeah, so on this laptop, usually I would have had a crash by now in regard to screen sharing, but fingers crossed it's actually doing pretty well today. Yep. Looks right. awesome. So, so this is what our Eagle widget has been capable of in the past. You know, you drag a board in, the red represents the, uh, the top layer, and then the blue is all the, uh, the tool paths that are inflated by this amount for your milling operation generated right around it. And we can get can in just, there because 3JS is awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just let me comment quick. I feel like when I'm trying to actually analyze my board, Chili Pepper is better for seeing all the traces of a certain signal than even Eagle is. Oh, absolutely, because Eagle's two-dimensional and it's flat and it's just very monotone in a sense. Yeah. And Chili Pepper lets me see, you know, all these different perspectives. Actually, I told you that when we started the uh, the two-layer stuff here. I told you that I looked at it, I rendered the bottom layer, and it's actually more productive for me to analyze that than to just stay in Eagle. I know, I agree. It's sweet. This is an amazing looking board. Okay. That's fun. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been able to do this. I don't think anybody's tried the Duet before. But we've been able to do this. What we can do now with the new code is we've got this drop down here that automatically populates with all the layers of the board. So guess what? The Duet has a bottom layer. Now we're just going to press that, and we're probably going to give it another second to do the uh, toolpaths. But you notice that we skipped over to the left side of the Y axis. Yeah, you're in so negative we, Y zone, but your Xs are still positive. OK, nice. Exactly. And now we're on the full screen where all of the um, rendering, if you will, is flipped now about the Y axis. But this is the bug that we've been trying to deal with, is that the toolpaths haven't been regenerated. So the toolpaths are still being uh, generated off of what I'll call, call old data that's still here in positive territory. Right. But at least but, right, rendering exactly. the bottom layer of the board. So even that's good exactly. progress that you helped get it to. Because before, it wasn't exactly. even looking at that layer. It was still looking at the top layer. Yeah. 
So the good news is that the rendering works now, and that took, I don't want to think about how many uh, sleepless nights that took to get all the aspects of the rendering going. Because some of this stuff is complicated, like uh, the elements rendering, for example. You know, uh, the way the code works, all of the pads and all of the components and also all of the plated through holes, they're all considered elements. So just having to deal with it in every single spot and flip it, that took a lot of work to get it to the point that it's at right now. Hey, you're preaching to the choir here with uh, uh, the original code I had to write to sort of <laughs> slowly build through the board file. It was it was it was kind of fun, but it was a lot of work. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the here is kind of fun. with what you yeah. got here, because of the way I actually make double sided boards, I take really thin FR four and I mill the top and I mill the bottom. On on like on the side to the side of it, I cut them out and then I just epoxy them together. So I actually could use this code the way it is today. Exactly. So that was one of the great things uh, that you told me. If you want to do four layer boards, for example, you mill them all in the upright orientation individually without any flips whatsoever, and then you would uh, epoxy them all together. And I kind of thought of that, and I looked at. And I kind of imagine like this really big LED cube kind of thing where you've got, you know, 16 layers with, you know, just jumpers connecting them all because you need space for the soldering iron to get in and solder the jumpers in, on both sides of each FR4. Exactly. So just this huge grid of circuit board. And then I didn't want to think about the impedance patterns on that. So I stopped thinking about it. Well, you know, I watched some videos about how they actually are making these commercially and they really do just epoxy the layers together but they put them in a pretty much in press to really you know get it together but you could do a lot of that at home you just put it in a vise and, and epoxy it yeah. and no, then the bias through it's interesting what's that the bias is where it gets interesting because the fabs have plating machines essentially where they just every single time they do a epoxy combination they would just kind of dip it in in a sense and all of the uh, the plated through holes, including the bias, would be done that way. So it's a little more uh, work by hand for people like us. Yeah, I agree. But you know, it's funny. I now have three different techniques I'm going to try for through hole plating, which I haven't tried yet. But I've got the copper chemicals that I bought from one of the suppliers. I also have this silver paste that I know you were playing with that I was going to try. And then I feel like there's also just shoving it full of solder. You just fill the hole. Yep, it'll take some time, but that's probably the best way to try going about it. Because if that works, that'll work. You might need like a little uh, clipped leg of a resistor or something just to use as a jumper or just some solid core wire. Yep, exactly. Oh, I bought some of those rivets too. But oh, let me ask you something. You don't need the drills on the bottom layer then, right? I'm noticing there's not drills there. Are there that? Is that because basically you would expect the drills to happen at the top layer? I would. Or, well, we have to think about this a little bit because the drilling is done as part of the dimension, right? It's it's the same. Is it handled at the same time as the board outline? Because we have to cut the board out last. Yeah. You know, in fact, so did I, did I we, would do those at the same time. Did we lose the drill capability in this new publish? I that's a good, good question. Let yeah. me go back to top for a minute. Now, what should I be looking for? Because I think if we're looking for small outlines within, we have those. Yeah, maybe only when you generate the G code are you going to get the drills. Uh, I forget. Remember, uh, okay. Frank was the one that did the drill code. And yeah. you get a, a, a section in your render or your G code tab, maybe. Go to your G code tab and see if there's a drill section. Sure, once the uh, toolpaths show up, I can click oh, yeah. up here. That's the downside of having such a massive board. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Three, two, one. Anytime now. There we go. Hey, there we yeah. go. You got There's that G code. No. <laughs> yep. Depth of milling traces, feed rate. Yeah, we definitely have drilling holes enabled. Yeah, I think you're right. I was watching that video by Frank that you're talking about. I was actually watching that earlier today, and there's nothing in the render that shows it. It's just the little vertical line that shows the plunge yeah. when you generate the G-code. You know, he could probably, or we could, or anybody else could go, you know, fork this and maybe add the drill rendering. But maybe just go ahead and send the G-code to Workspace. Let's, let's see. Sure. Yeah, I imagine, like, a nice little miniature cone or some sort of, Geometry, just put that at the center above every hole. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. with this amount of scattered movement, there's definitely, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's the verticals right above each hole, indeed. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So if I go and try the bottom layer now, it's not going to change because the G-code is still being generated based on the, uh, the tool paths, which are still on the right side. So this is that part that we still need to fix. Yeah. But you know what? You're right. You may end up with drills. Well, it's okay. I mean, assuming the board gets lined up perfectly. It is okay, because actually for me, I need the drills on the bottom layer as well because um, of the way I'm doing it with epoxy. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Because wouldn't the holes be taken care of on the top layer? Why would you need to repeat? Because what I'm actually doing is I'm using really thin FR4, like it's half the yes. thickness of what you're, okay. you expect. And there is not copper on the top and bottom. There's just copper on the top. You mill both out facing up, and then you cut them out, and then you flip the bottom over, squeeze epoxy into it, and shove them together in a vise. Oh, okay, so you're not flipping the board for the bottom layer. You're doing them individually. Right. right. So technically, you're, okay, you're, yeah. like, you're physically flipping the board after the fact. Um, and so you do want to actually mill it facing up. I'm trying to think visually, am I am I thinking that through, through correctly? Because I've not done it yet. You'll want to mill facing up, I think. I think that's right. And then I gotta just drill holes in top and bottom and then the holes darn well better line up. Yes, because um, if you watch my mouse movement right now, when you mill it on the left side of the Y axis, so negative X, it's just a 180 deg degree flip that way. So no matter yeah. how you flip no matter how you mill the board Either of these orientations are also in the negative Y territory there. You should still be able to line them up, but I think there might be one case where you can't. So yeah, we'll have to test that out and actually, you know, print some of these renderings out and figure stuff out. Yeah, I, I think the more I visualize this, the more maybe it wouldn't work, but uh, whatever, we're getting close. And I think the point yeah. of showing this off to folks is that we're, we're able to show these multiple layers now um, and so we're getting really close. It'd be great to get more folks involved if they want to. Um, Absolutely. Is that thing still rendering? Because what I'm wondering is... No, that's good. Do you want to try out a um, an Arduino I'm micro? The micro, exactly. Because the micro has four layers, and I want people to see that if you have a 16-layer board, it will render a 16-layer board. Now, is it showing this as the blue? Yeah, so I noticed this bug uh, when we were talking a little earlier. But for some reason, when you when you were on the bottom layer and then you drag a new board in, it stays on uh, blue. I don't know off the top of my head if this is the top or the bottom because it says top here. Yeah. But if I go have... to one of the middle layers, we're all set now. Yeah. So I just have to do a refresh and we're all set. Yeah. I think I know how to do that. It would just be when you drag a new board in, we have that event fire off, and then I'll just change the uh, the color back to yeah. the red. Yeah, that's, totally. that's global, it so it's not a problem. Swapping layers here. The only other yeah. thing we can do too is because JavaScript supports threading now, where you can offload to another thread, it's a little yes. bit involved. Um, it'd be great to get that rendering uh, offloaded to a, a sub thread, just so you don't get that kind of pause, that wait message you were getting. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. I think <laughs> if somebody took that on, that would be really awesome. Yeah, this looks great. So this is kind of fun to see this as a four-layer board. Now, exactly. in, in the four layers, would people do the power layer and the um, that other layer facing up? I'm guessing they would. And like, At this point in time, we have two use cases. The one of them is you've got two halves with double-sided copper clad. So you still need to do the flip. So you would mill one double-sided copper clad with the top and the power and then you would mill the other one with the ground and the bottom. And then you would only have to epoxy one set together. But you know, you then they would touch. You'd almost have to put a, a an empty FR4 between them. Yes, you would. So that makes me think you're better off doing one-sided for all of them, and then you just epoxy them together. Yep, so that was roughly the logic that we were going in with, is that there's going to be a couple of check boxes that I need to add around here somewhere. One of which is, do I want to flip the bottom layer? Yeah. Based on the logic that only the bottom layer would ever need to be flipped if you're doing a two layer board and you're gonna flip it after the top. So you possibly just need to let it be per layer to let the user decide, because it really depends on how they want to do it. Sure. 
Yeah, so uh, one of the guys in the Google group was suggesting some of the things based on the, uh, the flat cam, was it, uh, wizard? Yeah. Where you allow the user to suggest, hey, I want to flip this about the y-axis, or hey, I want to flip this about the x-axis. And then there were a handful of other variables. Yeah. And I think now is probably going to be a good time to start implementing those with the render. But then we have to deal with the uh, creation of the tool pads and clippers and everything else from the render as opposed to from the raw data. Well, and what I'd like to do too is I'd like to be able to gang up all of the layers side by side to kind of see and maybe even lay it out um, exactly. so that I could mill them all in one nice long operation. And then, you know, I, when I'm finally cut out the dimensions at the end, I'm cutting all layers out and then I do my own epoxying. Exactly. So I think that's perfect because we would, okay. So we could absolutely create individual 3JS objects for each layer. And then we could render a whole bunch of them side by side. Yeah. That's totally, totally. doable. But then yeah, we just have to generate G code based on that, uh, whatever object we feed the generator as opposed to the existing. Yeah. So in the parent 3JS object, which you've already done, you've given each each layer a parent so you can flip. We could also just do an XY offset for each one. And then we definitely have to just attach that clipper paths to the 3JS object or or generate the clipper paths from the object once it's got its sort of parent object set up. So I, I think we've got a pretty good pathway here to success for the next version. No pun I'm sure. What's that? I said no pun intended, I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we've said path how many times this evening? I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, good. So thanks for the rundown. This is looking awesome. Um, really exciting stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to all the next steps here. Uh, Absolutely. I'm really excited about the fact that this is sitting in the actual live Tiny G workspace now, as opposed to just some awesome, but nonetheless, very, very restricted Cloud9 environment, which we've been uh, developing in for the past month or so. I got to say, your Cloud9 environment's looking pretty sweet there. So um, Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, likewise, uh, you did a pull request through GitHub, and I was able to pull it into mine, and so that's a new thing we now have available with GitHub backing. So that's been awesome for collaboration too. So we're getting Absolutely. better here. Yes, and uh, the Node.js server takes care of all the hard things, so that the users don't have to worry about knowing all the. Uh, you called it sausage making. I found <laughs> that hilarious. Exactly. Yes, you just follow the three steps, and you're set up. Yeah, and the fact that your code now kind of gets self-documented as you um, run the runme.js to upload it to GitHub. So, okay. Well, thanks again, Ray. Uh, hopefully, we get some more videos going here in the coming months as we make further progress. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, pleasure talking to you. All right. You as well, man. Take it easy. Bye.